Good morning and welcome to Life for Nations Camarillo. Jesus already has the plan. Let's worship him this morning. Amen. Nothing really ever does compare to the promise that we have in Jesus. He is our answer, and he is our prayer. He is our hope. You know, something that has struck me this week is that when we accept Jesus into our heart, when he is the Savior of our lives, there is no second death. There is no worry about what happens next in our lives. You know, we can go through storms, great storms, and it can look very dire, and, and you're like, what are we going to do next? But God always has the perfect and right answer in heaven as it is on earth. And it's in heaven where we know everything is all perfect, cleaned up, righteous, put together, beautiful. But it's here on earth where we declare that. We declare it, we hope into it, we speak into it, and we say, Lord, you have the right plan. Well, this morning I want to talk to you a little bit about all of us, <laughs> me included, stop making excuses and stop arguing. Let's take a look at Matthew 4, 18 through 22. Matthew 4, 18 through 22. It says, one day, as Jesus was walking along the shore of the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, also called Peter and Andrew, throwing out a net into the water, for they fished for a living. I want to just stop there. Put your name in there. Jesus is walking along your office building. 
and he sees you and he sees you working hard. Maybe you're an electrical engineer. Maybe you're a school teacher. Maybe you are working, um, you know, in another field, medical field. You're a doctor. You're a nurse. You are doing something for a living. And Jesus called out to them, verse 19, come and follow me and I will show you how to fish for people. I will show you how to lead people. I will show you how to find people and give them new life, new life where they are filled with a joy that is eternal and filled with a joy that is beyond anything of this natural world where there's, you know, the end result every fall we see it the leaves will fall they will die and we will see a rebirth it's the rebirth that we want continuously and that only happens in jesus christ only in him well jesus said come and follow me and what did these boys do these men what did they do what do some of us always do we drop everything we left, we leave whatever we're doing and we follow him. Some of us have great ideas, great plans. Some of us are like, I got my 10 year plan ready to go. I'm, I'm a visionary. I can see that, um, let's see, we're going to be going on to college and then I'm going to go on to get a great job at a university and I'm going to become a great professor at that university and get my you know, I want to move up and become part of the, the staff there and uh, be invited to write books and, and to be on TV. You know, I've got a plan. I'm going to have a wonderful, beautiful family. We're going to have a nice big home. We want to live in this place. You know, we get plans. We got, we've got good plans. But Jesus might come along and say, drop everything because my plans are going to be far superior far greater than you could possibly imagine. There's some very famous people that have turned their lives around for Jesus Christ because they dropped everything of their plans, you know? They actually had great plans and it was already in place and they're like, you know what, I'm gonna let it go and I'm gonna walk into Christ and whatever his plans are is all that is going to make me, I know it's gonna bring me great peace and joy. I'm gonna quit fighting against what heaven is orchestrating for my life. I don't wanna be out of sync with heaven. I wanna be in sync with heaven. A little further up, verse 21, he saw two brothers, this is Jesus. He sees James and John sitting in a boat with their father Zebedee repairing their nets and he called to them too. And immediately followed him, leaving the boat and their father behind. This is crucial here. They actually dropped their career and dad so they probably had a business that was a family business and they said okay we're walking away now if you've ever watched in the chosen you know that the dad in the in the tv show version embraces that their son would follow this man um and i don't know how did peter and andrew just know that they should just follow jesus how do any of us know if you've already accepted jesus into your heart how is it that you know or knew at that time that you should just follow him. And what does that exactly mean? So what happened to cause them to drop their nets and just follow? Well, hmm, James and John walk away from the family business, walk away from fishing for a living. Um, how do they know this guy was the Messiah? And then the name of the title of my, of this message is don't argue and don't make excuses because I've encountered that a lot this week. Well, these men didn't slow down. They didn't start researching with questions about their future. Well, let's see. So Jesus, you want me to follow you, but how's my dad gonna make any money if they don't, he doesn't have his sons? And, and how is my, you know, my future, I, my inheritance for my children, if I should get married, would be caught up in that family business. And yet you want me to follow you? I don't see how that's gonna work, you know? I want heaven's orchestration to be all about my plans and not about yours. They didn't have excuses. They didn't have any arguments. They just moved forward. They let go and followed Jesus. And at that time, it says that Jesus was in a region called Galilee, which was beyond the Jordan. And he was fulfilling the prophecy from Isaiah. In Isaiah 9, 2, it says, the people who walk in darkness will see a great light. For those who live in a land of deep darkness, a light will shine. Hallelujah. 
Well, Peter, Andrew, James, and John lived in Israel in the time of great darkness. They were oppressed by Roman captors. The high priests in charge of Israel, were they were spiritually in charge. They were so oppressive and controlling, and many of them so corrupt. They had 631 rules, and the people were just burdened. Because if you messed up on a single one, it could mean the end of your spiritual walk with God. You were cut off from God completely is what the priests would tell you. And so you ended up living a life either of a lie, pretending like you followed them all, or, or hiding, or trying to, to pretend like you'd done everything correct. Some people were trying and they were doing very well. They did great. They liked following the rules. But how oppressive. And then on top of that, to have all the taxes from Caesar and the Roman guard running around your city, your, I mean, it it is, come to Camarillo, you're in this little cute town and you all of a sudden have a whole infiltration of, of, you know, let's pretend it's World War II and the Nazis come and invade and they're standing on every corner forcing you to do whatever they want. That would be very oppressive, very dark. Very painful to see your city captive by these, this army, this invading army, in this case, the Romans. Both of these groups of people, the Romans and the high priests and the Pharisees and the Sadducees, they wanted to keep the people under their control. The government and the church were keeping the people in darkness. Ouch. But what happens next? Jesus walks into the scene, he walks into the region, and his light begins to shine. He, it shines in people's hearts. These people, these men, Andrew, James, John, they have a breakthrough that would move them immediately from darkness to light. And this is why they followed him. Some of us go to church and we're invited to accept, accept, excuse me, accept Jesus Christ, and we immediately go from the burdens that we carried from all the sin and all the, the worldly life that we've carried on and we let go and walk into light and say, okay, this is going to be life. This is, this is where I'm moving towards Jesus Christ, the hope. The word of God is so full of rich promises that brings an absolute joy and fullness to each of our lives when we accept Jesus Christ as our Savior and begin to walk with him and drop the excuses and drop the arguments, you know, the natural ones to say, well, that'll never work because da, 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 right? Get into a church. That is something I've said twice this week to, to two different people. And the excuses abound, you know, but that's the morning I can finally sleep in, says one. But everybody's so superficial, says the other. These are excuses and arguments. We all need to be in a church. You are welcome to come here to our home. I can give you our address. We would love it if you came and we had a fellowship together. And right now we're in our living room. That's a big issue for a lot of people. People have come to know the Lord through this ministry. They have begun following Jesus Christ and, and walked into that light. But they're like, oh, no, I don't really like living room church. Is, that's weird. And that might be uncomfortable. And ah, excuses and arguments, right? If God has called you to listen and to walk into and be under pastors, you need to do it without a bunch of arguments, without a bunch of excuses. And then they immediately put up their hand and say, nice try. Okay. Did these men say nice try to Jesus? No, they didn't. And they didn't ever. They kept walking forward with him. And that's what we all need to do. If you're called to go into a church, go in. We always have been very loyal to our church, whatever church that God has called us to. And in some cases, Jesus had to come and bring a great light. There was a crisis moment. It was very difficult to see things lit up and we could see the truth of the matter in the classic church that we were so very loyal to. And we said, oh, this is not okay. This is something that is, in, this is a deal breaker, right? This is against the foundation of what we believe. We've got to walk away from this church, but where do we go next? And immediately the Lord showed us. The light was right before us and we said, Whoa, that's going to be difficult. That's going to be hard to walk away from classical church filled with lots and lots of people into something new. And we become 
the pastors in this city, this is, you know, ah, we had our excuses and our arguments. We walked forward into it, but we really did. Ah, there was a lot of things God had to move out of our lives for breakthroughs to begin to happen. And so we have, and we have seen it, and this is exactly what the disciples went through. And this is what we each need to go through, right? We want, they, these disciples said, I'm going to follow that word of life. I want to be a part of him. I want to be part of his work. I want to see other people, people like myself, radically transformed. It says in Matthew 4, 23, this is right after the disciples began following. And it was just the first four. I believe that he starts out with four and then he, you know, gathers his 12. But it says that Jesus went throughout Galilee, teaching in their synagogues. He went straight into their churches, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom, healing every disease and sickness among the people. Wow. That's what I want to see as well. I want to see people healed. I want to see them no longer have any sickness. That means emotional sickness, mental sickness, physical sickness, and also spiritually sick. People are oppressed, tormented day and night by the demonic if they don't know how to shut down those gates that they have left wide open. And how does that happen? Addictions, idolatry, you know, you're programmed. The devil will look for every way, shape and form to destroy your eternal destiny that heaven wants over you if you don't understand who Jesus Christ is and you don't walk into that lordship. I was thinking like when you say program in today's university, college and that kind of stuff, they are basically programming the children. They are programming like the, the, the young people yes. with this uh, indoctrination. Indoctrination. Yes. So their now curriculum becomes, is all about pushing their doctrine. And now it becomes like a stronghold inside yeah. this people's life. Yeah, because they can't get rid of that barrier mm. in their head. But whoa, no. I had a, a gal and she's part of a college. She was a professor and she could not get through creationism. No way, she said. Evolution is the only way. Well, things do evolve, absolutely. There is no doubt about that. But the problem is she wouldn't accept Genesis. She wouldn't accept that there was one God and one creator and he had created this whole earth. So there's always arguments and excuses that we tend to make. I, I, I kind of heard something, I think it was this week, that if, <clears throat> if it was like, if the earth, well, if the universe was so old as they kind of proclaim it is, then there would be an energy left hmm. uh, right now. Then everything, because and it's kind of like it kind of decays. So again and again, the logic is against yeah. it being billions of years old. So it, it was kind of interesting the way he kind of told like that. There has to be like a creator, like a beginning, and it can't be that far away because then it would have been kind of died out because of like, you kind of use up all this energy. Yeah, yeah. Well, in many churches I have visited and attended, I often see that they have some sort of vision statement. Um, my daughter took a class at one of them and there was like, by 2030, we're going to see, you know, 30,000 people come to know Jesus, something like that. Um, our church, our classic church, had some banners up in the front that said, no, grow and go. It was a catchy little phrase and they had banners and, um, you know, they wanted you to know Jesus as personal savior. They wanted you to get baptized and grow in your faith and then go and share the gospel with others. It was a simple and easy to understand phrase. Um, and it was basically the Great Commission in a nutshell. It was nice. I liked it. Um, and I observed many people would, yes, they listen to their pastor and say, yes, I want to step into ministry. And basically ministry um, was to volunteer like in the Sunday school class or to be an, a greeter, um, to help the kids get their little sticker um, because, you know, they had to have security. Um, there was all sorts of outreach ministries like feeding the homeless. We were part of that once uh, once a month. They once a month or once every three months, they'd go out to the park and we'd feed, uh, be part of that. Um, there was an annual missions trip to Mexico and they'd always go down to this one city where they were working with some missionaries and build a house. It was, it was neat. It was good. It was nice. Um, and everybody would participate. They'd get all into it. And then a lot of them would just leave. They'd leave the church. They'd move on. They'd become tired of the sermons, tired of, you know, they'd have arguments. Uh, you know, there was a, 
one time a pastor was asked to to go down in salary and become half time and not full time and that whole group that was around him just up and left and started their own church it was was very divisive um it wasn't a great feeling at all because then every time we encounter people from that church they'd actually give us dirty looks like we had betrayed them or somehow i wasn't even part of that decision i had no idea other people just you know bowed out excuses abounded the pastor asked me for tithes and offerings. How dare he ask me for money? Um, there was a lot of boredom sometimes. Uh, emotional highs, you know, I'm gonna go into ministry, I'm gonna help out in that Sunday school. And then they get there and be like, this is just basically, you know, corralling kids for a little while. Um, some of them loved going in. We'd, we'd go in and the worship team was really loud. It was more like a concert. It was very dark, a concert. We'd have strobe lights. We'd have foam and, and big screen. And everybody was, you know, yeah, we were all getting into this music like a rock concert. Very, very much like a rock concert. And uh, always lots of uh, donuts and coffee at the end and, and the really good donuts and coffee. I mean, really nice. Um, the sermons always had a great joke at the beginning. There was always all about being good and good opportunities to reach to the community. And uh, Pastor Nick and I kept trying to find spiritual nutrition for ourselves and for our kids. We kept trying to see where this church was leading us. We were faithful and loyal. We'd said we'd be members. But the main diet there was basically good intentions and make changes in your life to benefit the church. There was no real open heavens because every time that would come, perhaps in a worship service, they would shut it down. Well, everything was so like- It was timed. Timed, everything was like- yeah, down, down to, to the, the second. Seconds. They removed the Holy Spirit. They never even allowed him in. You know, go home and do that. There's no time for that here. Here we've got a little, you know, it's a routine. It's a schedule. We've got to stick to it. and. There wasn't any spiritual nutrition like there needed to be. And many didn't even know what they were missing and didn't know how to even ask for it. Well, Jesus did not come to establish his church to be this way. This is maybe what the Pharisees came. You know, I'm going to give you all these 631 rules and you must follow them to the exact, not even, you know, every single thing had to be exactly to the jot and the tittle, everything. T's crossed, I's dotted, no way out. If you mess up on a single one, even a little bit, you are out and no more heaven for you. I mean, how horribly stressful all the time to be under that oppressive rulership. And then if you've got the Romans on every corner just looking for an excuse to beat you, to destroy your business, to throw you in jail. And Jesus, I mean, that is exactly what Satan wants for your life. Let's just put it out there. Satan is a fallen angel who hates humanity and there's no way to save him. He made his choice and when the angels make their choice, they fall into that kind of a rebellion. But we humans were created in the image of God. And Jesus came to give us an abundant life, full of power, full of his healing, full of miracles and joy. With no excuses or arguments, I wanna follow Jesus. And that's what these men did as well. They followed because the Holy Spirit was leading them. Jesus was filled with the Holy Spirit. You know, right after he was baptized, there was that whole imagery of the dove upon him and the voice from heaven saying, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. And then the Holy Spirit led Jesus into the desert and he went through a time of great testing. He passed everything using and declaring the word of God and then what did he do? He called everybody to follow him. And when they followed him, the Holy Spirit was then leading them all through the man Jesus at that time. Today, we can follow Jesus by just asking him into our heart. And then the Holy Spirit will come inside of us and indwell us and lead us to whatever needs to be done in our lives next. With, but with, with the, the big, giant, and absolute no, you cannot spend time questioning, arguing, and made, making excuses. That is going to be a barrier that stops you from entering into God's perfect will for your life. It is something that you have to get through to yourself 
and choose every day. You can choose to love Jesus or you can choose to make excuses and arguments. You need to get hold of that supernatural flow from his words, the Bible, from his voice, listening to him and his actions. What would he want you to be doing right now? Every one of us has an assignment and a commission each day. He, he says, here's a book. It's written about you the moment you were conceived. This is why we're so pro-life and against everything that has to do with um, death or abortion, killing all these things. We are against this because we know that we were created in God's image. And the minute you were conceived, God said, you are male or you are female. That's another big thing. You see all these kids that lack an identity. They don't know who they are. And it's because God washed every single one of us completely. It, it happens in vitro at five weeks, every child is washed with the hormones that they are going to be a male or a female. And your entire body structure is from there, that moment forward, completely that gender. And there's no way out of it. There's no aesthetic surgery. You can do your mindset. You can walk around trying but in the end it is all just aesthetics and choices choices each day that each of us make i'm going to love that person i'm going to hate that person i'm going to walk in joy i'm going to walk in depression i'm going to walk in god's plans i'm going to walk away from them because i got my arguments and my excuses and a lot of us need to walk away from denial as well we are in such denial that we have any excuses or arguments but if you ask the question we've got them and they start to spout them off when we follow jesus christ and have the holy spirit leading us it breaks down all the excuses and arguments i've had to go through my testing believe me this is for me as well as for anybody that is catching on to part of this lesson let the holy spirit lead you let him lead you and walk in strength and power each day and then of course you've got your flesh Paul says it very clearly, I do what I want, I, I want to do what is good in Romans 7, 19, but I don't. I don't want to do what is wrong, but I do it anyway. But if I do what I don't want to do, I'm not really the one doing wrong. It's sin living in me that does it. Me as a Christian, as a woman filled with Jesus Christ, I want to walk in what God wants. But every, it happens every day. You know, we have choices at about five o'clock. I'm about to make dinner and I usually want to plug in and listen to something. Keep me, inter like not entertained, but you know, just I want to listen to something while I'm chopping onions. It's a, it's a tedious thing to have to chop. And um, <clears throat> um, I can hear the Holy Spirit saying, listen to the, to the Bible. Listen to the Bible app. I've got things I want to teach you just by listening to the word of God. And my flesh often says, no, oh, but wait, I, want, I might want to listen to this other thing. It might be important. I might want to listen to that. There might be news. And I, all, I, I, I then say, Holy Spirit, I'm going to listen to the word of God. That is the best book any of us can read, any of us. And you, if you're in a time of crisis, listen to the word of God. It is healing. It washes you clean. It changes your way of thinking and gets rid of all of the wrong thinking because oftentimes our mindset is absolutely against what God would want. And so I would, um, I would turn on my Bible app. I was listening to Jeremiah, which I have, I have to be honest, I've had a hard time reading through that one. It's really a, a difficult book to just read through. You know, your eyes start to glaze over. You're like, I don't know what's happening. If you listen to the Bible app, and I would recommend the New Living Translation just to make it nice and simple. It's actually a really good and very interesting and powerful book. And then people reading it do a really good job as well. So I recommend open it to anything. Psalms, read Proverbs, read Jeremiah, read the Gospels. Those are powerful because there's where Jesus is actually working and moving. Take action. Listen to his voice. Read his word every day. Romans 12, 2, do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, and then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good and pleasing and perfect will. There it is, every day. Test it, test what you're listening to. What is the spirit that you're listening to right now? 
Is it one full of arguments and excuses that you have too many things to do? On Thursday, we were listening to Pastor Jackie and there was a, a person who started to argue. And I remember thinking, wow, that is very bold to just, she's teaching, she's ministering. And it's like my kids right now, I'm in the middle of preaching a sermon and they start to, to demand that I, that I answer their question and that they come up with their excuses and arguments. This is a very strange thing to observe. I don't know. I, I don't think I ever even, sometimes we'd see it in church and it would be a big joke or, or we'd laugh it off, but it's never appropriate to interrupt the pastor with your excuses and arguments. Can you move forward? Jesus tells us that our hearts, when we just follow our emotions, when we are just following our little ways of thinking, you know, we might be lying to ourselves. <sighs> Oftentimes our hearts are just full of deceit and we can't rely on our emotions to give us his truth. How does his truth come into our lives? Not just the Holy Spirit, but through the word of God, through our pastors. Do you have a pastor that is actually spiritually covering you, calling you? Like my pastor has te um, texted me every day, almost every day. How are you doing? What's going on? How can I, what can, what, what is happening in your life? Uh, uh, other people, you know, what is happening with you? What's happening? How are you doing? You know, right now we're in a really difficult time. My mom, I love her so very much. People are covering her with prayer. It's called spiritual covering. It's like a hailstorm is falling and you're under a very powerful umbrella that lets nothing hit you. So you don't get bonked in the head and, and that storm might pass and another one's going to come. There's no relief from the storms of this life except in Jesus Christ. Wow. I'm going to say that again. There are no, there are no, there's no relief from the storms in this life, except in Jesus Christ. Jeremiah 17, 9 talks about the heart, the heart that wants to deceive, the heart that says everything's okay. And our emotions make us bring up these arguments and these excuses, right? I don't feel like it. My flesh says I don't feel like it. The heart is deceitful above all things and beyond cure, who can understand it? So you're in love with something, but it's not what God wants you to be in love with. Cut it off, let it go. I had to do that. I had a, a situation with a friend and this friend kept saying things and I came to my pastor and said, what do I do? And she said, cut that person off, let her go. Let her go and let God take care of the situation. Move forward with where you are being led. John and James and Peter and uh, his brother Andrew did not spend time going, but what about my friends and the party I have to organize tonight? What about, you know, this thing? I've got to take care of the tax issue or whatever. They didn't spend time on their emotions. You know, that's what usually brings up arguments. So does our mindset. You know, I, it's my way of thinking. I have been programmed by the news to believe everything I have been told. Luke 9, 23. Then he said to them all, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves, take up their cross daily and follow me. How does this all work out? We live on earth and God gave us emotions. He gave us physical bodies that get sick. He gave us minds to think. The key to understand all this is that we have an eternal spirit and we must now let our hearts, minds, and bodies be overshadowed by the Holy Spirit. Just like Mary, when she was overshadowed by the Holy Spirit to receive Jesus, just like the world when it began, the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God overshadowed everything and created this world. John 20, 21 through 22 says, and Jesus said, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. <clears throat> and with that, he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. When you carry the Holy Spirit, he will guide you. And you need to say every day, good morning, Holy Spirit. I want you to be the one to guide me today. Not my flesh, not my emotions, not my mindset, not my arguments and my excuses. Without his daily breath of life, we can't live into what he calls us to. Not by our actions, not by our words, and not by our feelings. 
they'll always lead us back to excuses and arguments. It's a supernatural empowerment. You can't go buy it. You can't earn it by jumping through a bunch of religious hoops. It's saying yes to Jesus every single day. Yes to his plans for your life. Yes to his overshadowing you each day. And yes to humbling yourself in the sight of the Lord, confessing your sins, confessing any excuses and arguments you've had, and let God schedule your day out. Let his timing be the right one. Whether you're going through a great deal of pain, whether you're going through a great deal of turmoil and crisis and fear, say, Lord, forgive me of my excuses and arguments. Forgive me for being in denial. And I just want your plans for this day. The next person that walks in, show me the opportunity I might have to minister to that person. What is your testimony? What is God teaching you or doing in your life today that you could share with others? What assignments are you on for him today? The most important assignment given to each of us is to find Jesus each day and serve him throughout our lives. In his power, humbling yourself in his sight every single day. Go to church, a church that nourishes your spirit. <clears throat> but what are your excuses and arguments to fulfill all these things? Lack of time. I need to work. I need to make money. Um, the church is superficial. You need to go to the church where you are being fed and where the pastor and where the congregation are looking for open heavens. They want the Holy Spirit to come upon them. They want to be engaged with each other in one synergy, in one frequency from heaven. That is the kind of church. And it might not be perfect. You're not perfect either. None of us are except in Christ. And so when we come to be a part of that church, we want to be a part of that <clears throat> orchestra from heaven. Just like my kids, they have to practice that musical instrument or it's out of tune, it's out of sync. It doesn't make any sense. It doesn't sound right. It sounds like a cacophony. And so we don't want to do that, right? If you're part of a church, you need to make sure you're in the right frequency with that church. And we were with our church, but we went, came to discover that they were not opening up any kind of portal to heaven and they were not in sync with heaven. They were in sync with themselves and in sync with the church plan and in sync with, with the, <clears throat> their little great commission, go, no, no, go and grow, which all sounds real nice, but you can't do it unless you've been empowered by the Holy Spirit. And sadly, they cut things off right there. You get baptized in water, but never in the Holy Spirit. And there cannot be a powerful life in Christ without that. It is very difficult. I've seen it and I've observed it, but what ends up happening is you just, you end up seeing a lot of apathy in people. Leaders do rise up and I've seen leaders out there, but they're not leading people to find Jesus in this supernatural, powerful way. I'm not sure if anyone can really explain it in the most perfect way. It's the Holy Spirit that needs to guide each one of us because heaven is open to all of us. We need to humble ourselves in the sight of the Lord each day and say, Lord, what is your plan? And where are you leading? Holy Spirit, guide me so that I'm covered by some <clears throat> spiritual pastors that are trying to open up heavens every single day. And that just means worshiping him, lifting him up, reading his word. I mean, the basics come like little children, dance before the Lord, enjoy his presence, seek him with all your heart, get nourished and let go of those excuses and arguments. Let's pray, okay? Father God, I just pray for each person that is listening. Father, we confess that we need to humble ourselves in your sight every single day. And we ask you to forgive us when we don't. I, as a leader, can get all prideful and full of myself and believe that my words are truth and that everybody just needs to listen to me. But I'm so grateful for the overshadowing of your Holy Spirit and for the guidance that you give to me through my husband and through our pastors that we can keep ourselves in frequency in the frequency of heaven when we're out when we're off when we're stressed when we're yelling at everybody and we need to calm down and we have an attitude forgive us lord forgive me lord forgive me for the excuses mm -hmm. forgive me for the arguments forgive me lord for thinking that i'm above everybody else and that somehow i get a special plan that nobody else gets where i get to be in your face and argue with you 
and nobody does that. We come before you humbly, Lord. We come before you and say, Jesus, you are the one we magnify. You are the one that we lift up. It is to you that we confess lordship and ask you to forgive us. Any, any hardened hearts, any mindsets that are, are so hard, I, I ask you to break them down now. It is only your Holy Spirit that can break down those mental um, blocks, the, the hardened heart, the the stiffness in us that says no i'm going to argue i know more i know best uh and and we don't humbly submit ourselves to our spiritual guidance the spiritual leadership and we say uh, we we think we know it all forgive us lord forgive us lord fill us with your presence mm -hmm. fill us lord with your presence guide us to you jesus Lord, we just ask you right now that each person listening, you would breathe on them. Holy Spirit, come, breathe on us. We want to have a week of supernatural power, supernatural growth. We want to see things change everywhere. We change the atmosphere to open heavens over each person that is listening so that they are filled with your glory, filled with your power, ready to listen to your word and Stop having excuses. Say no to the flesh and say yes to Jesus Christ. And let the word of God cleanse you, heal you. Heal your mindset and your body and your spirit and your emotions. Heal you completely. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. And if you want to contact us and know more, please contact us. But Thank you. So, that's uh... So my, the title today is Christ is our High Priest. So I want to read from Hebrew 9. Uh, so that the first, okay, so let's start from verse uh, 1 here. Uh, that the first covenant between God and Israel had regulations for worship and a place of worship here on earth. So this is what God showed Moses, how the tabernacle should be designed, how they should kind of do this. Uh, how does she kind of I call conduct the worship and where they should also do it on earth so basically he told them gave them like instruction how this tabernacle should be created and this is uh, this was more like this tabernacle that you kind of collapse uh, because they were still like walking in the desert so they had to be able to collapse this tabernacle and then bring it up again on the next place where God took them and then in verse 2 says, there were two rooms in the tabernacle. In the first room were the la lampstands, a table, a sacred loaf of bread on the table. This room was called called the holy place. Mm. So they have like this bread. I, I think they kind of changed it like maybe once per week or something. Mm. Like it was called like this bread of, um, yeah. It's, this is kind of special bread that they kind of mm -hmm. make, which is... Uh, Sanctified. But sanctified, yes. And it, and it means the bread of life. Yes. Yes. So, and, and Jesus is our bread of life, yes. by the way. That is exactly what he it came was, to say. Like yeah. And when we take communion, we're taking that bread of life. And then verse 3. Then there was a curtain. And behind the curtain was the second room called the most holy place. In that room were a gold incense altar and a wooden chest, uh, chest called the Ark of the Covenant. So this is the one that they had created uh, God gave him instruction and this is like uh, this box which has this uh, uh, the mercy seed and like it's kind of like I think it's like two there's two cher angels, angels two cherubs, cherubs and their wings yeah. are like this it's covered in gold so it, it kind of looks like a seat yes well and that's exactly the mm. seat that Jesus came and sat on he is the one who came and took all of our sins away which is what that seat represented so uh, this covenant of the ark it was covered with gold on all sides and inside the ark were a gold jar containing manna so this is the manna that was that god sent down to the over the well to the people of israel when they that's were right. kind of walking in the in the desert that's right and then we also have iron staff that sprouted leaves and the stone tables of the covenant so uh if you recall that uh, i think it was like a uh, kind of like a contest something who was supposed to be the the priest and um uh, and they had uh i think they have all some kind of like uh staff and then and it was 
the I, one who, who who sprouted the yeah sprouted that that's the that, almond it was an almond yeah so um, that's the one leaf. that that was the one who was supposed to be the the high priest if you think and, about it a staff is a stick that's been cut off yeah, from any 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 tree it's been you know cleaned up and whittled down yep. and there's no roots how could it possibly like a start to sprout almondly it's a that's a miracle in itself yeah. it's amazing well the manna was a miracle that's yeah. the bread again a bread that god fed them that he is the tree of life here we've got the tree of life yeah wow and, and then, then had, of course the ten commandments yeah that had ten commandments uh, let's see, and then uh okay so and then five about the ark where it's a uh, cher cherubim of divine glory whose wings stretch out over the ark's cover mm. And the place, uh, the place of atonement. But we cannot explain these things in detail now. So this is what it says in the verse five. There. So the tabernacle, he had like a, he also had like an outer court, and then they had like the two rooms, uh, like what it, what was described in verse two and three. But they also had like an like an outer court where, um, um, it's kind of like it's uh, almost like a fence around the whole thing where you have like the two rooms inside and then verse six when these things were all in place the priest regular entered the first room as they perform their religious duty so they came in for to the room of the holy place yes and then they kind of did their their like the the duties the duties they were supposed mm, to do that's right but only the high priest uh, ever entered the most holy place which was now the second room and only once per year. So he couldn't just decide, well, today I feel like I want to go into the Holy of Holies. No, he could only go in once per year. Yeah, it was very sacred. It was and really strict. No one was, was allowed to go yeah, in. It I was mean, only the high priest. That's right. And uh, and it says that, and he always offered blood for his own sins and for the sins of the people that's who had right. committed in ignorance. That's right. By the, these regulations, the Holy Spirit revealed that the entrance of the, to the most holy place was not freely open as long as the tabernacle and the system is represented. The, the, the system, system that represented, represented were, were still, still in use. So, so you can see that they could not just say, "Well, today I want to go into the Holy of Holies." It was like it was only once per year, and uh, they had to also bring blood. They had to bring blood to. To uh, for cover for the sins, it was such a rigorous uh, proceeding to kind of get in. I think he had to kind of cleanse for like three days or something before yeah, he had to kind fast, of and he had to. It was such like a everything. It was there's so much yeah, procedure. There was so much because it has to be holy. It was a heaviness. So, so that, that that's why it was it was so holy, so that they couldn't just like casually just walk in. It was such a like uh, uh, they had to prepare so much to be able to kind of enter into the Holy of Holies. And the priest rotated uh, each week. And there were like 24 families that did it, that did a priest duty. So 24, so it's, they kind of did like, they had to do it like twice per year, maybe some probably three times per year because 24 is 48. So we have like 52 weeks. So it's, yeah, so it was probably overlapping with like four weeks there. So, but uh, uh, so it wasn't like, they, they were not kind of like, that they didn't have to kind of work each week. They was more like they had, they had like the rotation. So they, they didn't kind of get like exhausted. So they kind of got some kind of break, but, but I'm pretty sure they, they probably did other stuff. So there was a real practical yeah. whole side yeah, to yes. the whole thing. But then it was only the high priest that was allowed to go into the most holy of holies. And it was only once per year. Mm -hmm. And the role of the highest priest was the supreme re religious leaders of the, the Israelites. Mm -hmm. And this position, it was something that you inherited. And there was no like a voting. Okay, so let's re-vote who's going to be the high priest. I mean, mm -hmm. that's kind of like what we measure about this, the staff that when, uh, when some other people claim that, well, we can be the high priest too. But then God showed it was Aaron who mm -hmm. was supposed to be the high priest. So there was no like you don't you didn't elect or, or vote for a high priest. It was right. something that a person inherited. And when that person died, then, yes. it, then it was the, the next in line, this the son mm. uh, was supposed to now take that place. And even even at the high priest, he could participate in the ordinary priest and minister, like what the priest kind of regularly did. Uh, but only like a certain function was given to him. 
So it was only the high priest who could wear like the urim and turim, tum, mm-hmm. tumin, tumin, urim. So there was like some kind of engraved dice like stones. It was used to kind of determine the truth or uh, the truth or falsity. Uh, so falseness. Yeah, fa- falseness. So if it was true or false. So because of this, now the Hebrew people would go to the high priest to know the will of God. Mm. So they could ask him, okay, what is the will of God in this? And then he could use this thing to, to kind of, I'm not sure how it worked really, but it's, uh, uh, but the most important duty of the high priest was to conduct the service of the day, uh, the service on the day of atonement. It was only the high priest, like what we said before, who was allowed to enter the most holy of holies which was behind the veil and stand before God. So this is basically, now you cannot stand before the throne of God. So that's why it was so holy. Hmm. Um, and he, he made a sacrifice for himself and for the people. He brought the blood into the most holy of holies and sprinkled it on the mercy seat. In Hebrew 9.9 it says, this is an illustration pointing to the pre- present time for the gifts and sacrifices that he the priest offers are not able to cleanse the conscience of the people who bring them. Um, so then, so like what we see, he had to bring blood into the most holy of holies to spring, sprinkle on the mercy seat to, to cover for the sins of himself. First, I mean, he had to cleanse himself like three days before, but then he had to kind of bring this blood now into cleanse, I mean, both himself also and the people of Israel with this blood. In verse 10, then, for that old system deals only with food and drink and various cleansing ceremonies, uh, physical regulations that were effect only until a better system could be established. So, Amen. So it was the, this, what he kind of, like, the whole thing, he kind of went into the Holy Fathers and all this stuff. It was just, like I say, it was just a sermon to kind of like, of food and drinks. Basically, I mean, he basically took blood from like a, uh, some kind of lamb or a cattle or something. Um, so it was just something that kind of was like a temporary thing mm-hmm. until something better system could Thank be Thank you, Jesus, for a better system. I can't imagine yeah. today. <laughs> if we had to kind of... Trying to get to Jerusalem, trying to get our special offering. I mean, you'd have to really literally move to Israel to be able to get that done. Yeah, I'm not sure how... To the, be able to yeah. make it to the uh, walk to Jerusalem or, or drive there to make this big ceremony... Mm-hmm. Seven times there were different feasts that we were to make sure that we honored. And I mean, we do honor the Lord. We do make feasts, but it's it was very specific and it was very much a very oppressive system in a way because of the way the people were forced to do it. God meant it for good, but there was a better system. And I praise God to t- that today in 2023, we are living under the better system. But can, can, can you imagine like if you still had the system today, I mean, Everyone had to go to Israel. Yeah. To Israel. I mean, can you imagine how crowded it would be? Oh, my. Well, and that's exactly why Jesus yeah. got lost at one point, you yeah. know, that Mary and Joseph didn't even realize that they had yeah. weren't bringing him home. So the animal sacrifice was just a temporary solution. In Hebrews 10, 3 to 4, it says, But in those sacrifices, there is a reminder of sins year by year. Because they had to, each year, they had to kind of redo this cleansing. They had to come back. Okay, cleanse us. Cleanse well, every us. September in Yom Kippur, yeah. it's the day of atonement. Yes, it's the that, day of saying, happens, I'm yeah. confessing my sins, and I confess my sins for a whole year. I mean, when I was, the message I gave just a few minutes ago was all about humble yourself in the sight of the Lord every day. And that's the new system of not having to do that. For it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. So it's a, so it, so the reminder was still there. Uh, so now the question is, did he only sacrifice once per year, like at this day of atonement? When we read the Old Testament, we read about all different kind of sacrifices. They had to sacrifice in order for God's people to approach, for, in order for God's people to be able to approach him for all different kind of reasons. I mean, you had all the different kind of like, um, like celebrations. And they had to kind of sacrifice something so they could approach him uh, since they were still affected by sins committed each day. 
so they had to continue to sacrifice animals to cover for the sins. I didn't like the priest always kind of continue to sacrifice. Every, it was day and night yeah. that they had to be doing this, and then there was they needed water to be cleansing yeah, this thing. Says. And if you watch the chosen, there's always this issue of water because they had to be able to do these special ceremonies that were all about cleansing mm. and water. So uh, they could not approach God if they had sin in their life. So now that we don't do sacrifice. Uh, we don't do animal sacrifices. So how do we get our sins covered now? So if we not continue to Hebrews 9:11, it says, "So Christ has now become the high priest over all the good things have that 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 have come. He has entered a greater, more perfect tabernacle in heaven, which was not made by human hands, and is not part of this." creative world amen so now he entered to the the real tabernacle which is in heaven because i mean what moses did was just uh a, a like poor, a shadow or a like a poor like reflection image, of what was already what, in heaven what was in heaven so god told him to give god gave him instructions and in 12 it says with his own blood not the blood of goats and cows he entered the most holy place once and for all time and secured our redemption forever amen so what when the, uh, when the levitical pre high priest entered the most holy of holies, they had to bring the blood from a sacrificed animal to cover their sins but that was just a shadow of the heavenly things in hebrews uh, 8 5 8 well, 8 5 and 8 it says who serves a copy and shadow of the heavenly things so this tabernacle that Moses was instructed to make, it was just a shadow of the heavenly things. Mm -hmm. I mean, they could not, even though I'm pretty sure that, that the temple of, uh, like the one that Solomon erected, which was a day was kind of planned, it was supposed to be kind of spectacular, but I don't think it could even, uh, what's it? Compared to Compared heaven. to what is in heaven. It's kind of like, um. I was just thinking of Yosemite. I love Yosemite. And there's a beautiful rock called Half Dome. Um, and often there is a lake right at the base. And it's called Mirror Lake because you can see a mirror image of Half Dome when you look into the lake. But that's basically what we have here on Earth. All mm -hmm. we ever do is get to look into the lake and see Half Dome as opposed to looking up at it or climbing it or being there. I mean, that is the difference. It is so mm. overwhelmingly more beautiful, amazing, more powerful. And that is him. That is that temple. Mm. So, but, when, but, when, but Christ, when he died on the cross, he now became the high priest and came into the more perfect tabernacle in heaven. And he brought his own blood since he was sinless. He now became the ultimate sacrificial lamb Amen. that will give us a redemption for all eternity. Amen. The better system. Yeah. So, uh, do you also rem uh, do you also remember that the high priest he had a position for the rest of his life, but since Christ lived forever, he will forever be our high priest. That's right. Amen. So he never dies. So he is always our high priest now. That's right. And Amen. he will never there will never be anyone else. He is the high priest that is standing in our gap. Yes, yes, he is. And and do, doing that like the high, the high priest duty for us. He went and did everything yeah. that the goats and the calves had been doing all that time and said, enough of it all. In Hebrews 9, 30, it says, Under the old system, the blood of goats and bulls and the ashes of the heifer could cleanse people's bodies from certain ceremonial cer Cer ceremonial cer let me let me do it okay. ceremonial, ceremonial impurity. impurity just think how much more the blood of christ will purify our conscience from sinful deeds so that we can worship the living god for by the power of the eternal spirit christ offered himself to god as the perfect sacrifice for our sin amen so he he's the one who sacrificed himself like the perfect sacrifice. I mean, a lamb, it was like a temper. It could, it could just temper and cover the sin. But God, he was the perfect sacrifice for our sin. And it covers our sin uh, from now and for the future. Amen. The fifth, now, that is why he is the, the one who mediates a new covenant between God and people. So do you remember before when we talked about that, while it was like the old way, before... 
it came something new and now the new came to replace the old thing mm. so that all so that all who are called can receive the eternal inheritance God has promised them for Christ died to set them free from the penalty of the sins they had committed under the first covenant mm. so now he replaced the old one yes. and he's the new one now amen so that I mentioned before that each time a Hebrew approached God, they had to cleanse themselves. And that's that's why they brought out the sacrifice, sacrificial animals. Like we mentioned before, they always con continue had to kind of sacrifice animals. But now when Jesus offered himself as the perfect sacri sacrifice, the perfect sacrifice for our sin, and he only had, had to do once and for all. Amen. He didn't have to kind of re-sacrifice himself. That's right. It was just once and for all. And it will cleanse past, present, and future sin. Hallelujah. And we cannot worship um, God since we are now in Christ. God doesn't see our sins, but we are not covered in the blood that Jesus shed when he died on mm. the cross. Mm. The blood that he, that he kind of presented when he came into the most holy of holies in the tabernacle in heaven. That's right. So have you accepted the free gift that God has gave you through Christ yes that he cleanses your sin with his blood that he that he represent that he presented before God in the in the whole of all mm. to to cover for our sins that he died and that he was this uh, ultimate sinless mm. sacrificial lamb that's right so Jesus paid for our sins but we have to accept that gift and believe in him and make him the Lord of our life hallelujah let's pray mm. Lord we ask Thank you, Lord, that that you, that you, what you did on the cross, that you, that you took your blood and came into the the tabernacle in heaven, and that you represented the blood to cover for our sins, and like what the high priest came into the to the mercy seat to sprinkle the blood to cover the sins, you came into the to the tabernacle in heaven, to. To, to give your blood for our sins. We just thank you for that you did. And we just pray for each one now right now. That they will just accept the free gift that you gave them. That you have given them. Because it's a gift. It's nothing that you force us on. It's a gift we have to accept. And that, that through your blood we are covered. We Our sins are covered. Our sins are washed away. Hallelujah. And Lord, that all we need to do is just believe. We yes. need to believe that you Amen. did this for us. Amen. And that we accept that gift. And that we also make you as the Lord and Savior. Which means that we have to just obey you and follow what you yes. have told us. Yes, today. Lord. So just pray for each one Jesus. right now that 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 they won't see it as kind of just rules and regulations, but that they see that it's it's for our freedom. That yes. you know what's best for us. Amen. And you know why? Why? Because the reason we follow. Uh, the guy not got it because he knows how we work and he created us. He knows what is best for us, and uh, so that we don't just go and do our own stuff because that will just cause mess and and bad mm, stuff. Mm. So Lord, help us to just realize that you are only doing this for our best. So just pray right now for each one out there right now that mm. they would just accept you as as the savior and accept that gift that you cleansed cleansed their sins because of the blood that you shed. So we just pray for this week. We pray for strength. We just pray, Lord, help us wherever we go, Lord, that we will be a light for you. That's right. That we will be an ambassador. Yes. That we will just walk in that power that we get from the Holy Spirit. Mm. When the Holy Spirit mm. comes over us, that we will have that power to do the same kind of miracle that you did when you were walking around with yes, Jesus. Lord. Because uh, you, are, you are inside us. And that we have access to the same power that you have. So just pray right now, Lord, that we just walk in that power. And that we will see people such be with peace. We see people be healed and we and Lord that we will just um see as people come to you and that we will see that revival. We will see the revival of our nation, Lord. Because it's we know that you are the only one who can set people free. You are the only one who can transform people and get rid of the wickedness, get rid of the darkness. Amen. Because we know that when you are getting hold of people that will be a transformation. The darkness has to flee because the yes. light has come into that, that Hallelujah. person. Yes, so just pray Lord. right now, Lord, that we will see a hunger and we will see us and, and uh, people just come in in waves and like yes, run to, mm. to your presence. That's right. Lord, we just lift up this day. We just lift up this week. In your name, pray. 
Amen. 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 Well, it's been a wonderful time. Powerful. God has lots to teach each one of us. Chew on whatever it is that you gleaned from this wonderful message and have a wonderful week. A week with your families. Um, you know, we are part of a much bigger church. This is actually their platform, Vida para las Naciones Internacional. Our senior pastors are Pastor Jack and Ismael Flores. And we're so very grateful to them for helping us, helping us to be better pastors, helping us to move forward, helping us to stop getting full of excuses and arguments. And so uh, I, I recommend you listen to them. They're on at 11 today. And we will just send you blessings, blessings to your family, blessings to each one of you. And please join us. Uh, contact us if you want more information or you want prayer. Have a wonderful week in the Lord. Goodbye. <laughs>